I believe the big picture lesson that we take away from the Christmas story is that we should rejoice when God's purposes are being worked out. That when we recognize God's purposes are emerging, personally, in a broader way, whatever that looks like, our appropriate response is to rejoice. We celebrate the Christmas story, but for Jesus, I don't know how exciting that was. He was subject to all the limits and the frailty of a human body. His journey through time was not always blessed. Lots of rejection, lots of pushback. Ultimately, he, he, he's executed. We should rejoice when the purposes of God are being worked out. I want you to keep thinking about that with me for a minute. It's not always fun or easy or convenient or comfortable. It's reorienting. Sometimes there's a laying aside and a turning loose and a putting down so that you can pick up something new from the Lord. And then in learning something new, you feel awkward and, and ill at ease and, and a little bit exposed and more vulnerable. And the invitation is to rejoice because the purposes of God are breaking forth. Well, couldn't God's purposes break forth? You see, the truth is, I don't know how much we care about God's purpose. What I really want is God to care about my purpose. I keep showing God my to-do list and saying, could you not focus just for a minute right here? And I think God keeps inviting me into his purposes. Look in Luke chapter 6. Jesus is speaking. He said, blessed are you when men hate you. Now, if Jesus hadn't said it, I wouldn't believe it. But I trust him. Blessed are you when men hate you. I'm really thinking it's more blessed when people like me. Right? I mean, if you're going to throw rocks or money, I choose money. <laughs> blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Jesus said there's a blessing in that. And I don't believe he's just speaking rhetorically. He says, rejoice in that day, leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. So he's inviting us towards an imagination that, that the reward of our existence is not going to be most fully understood in time. Now, does God make a difference in our lives in time? Absolutely he does. But the real payoff for your faith is in eternity. And if for a moment you suffer or endure or are rejected or mocked or you lay down, Jesus said, rejoice, even if it grows to hatred. Because God's purposes are breaking forth on your behalf. So this couldn't be God. Couldn't be God if you're falsely accused. Couldn't be God if you're betrayed. Couldn't be God if you're arrested. Couldn't be God if you're beaten beyond recognition. Couldn't be God if you're executed. But he was. So Jesus isn't speaking to us from some theoretical idea. He's speaking to us from an assignment that he has fully embraced for himself. I want to add to that a passage from 1 Peter. Peter is one of my heroes in the Bible. He's one of those very unique characters. We, we get to follow Peter's journey his Jesus journey from the time of his the early time of his life until very near the end of his life. We first meet Peter in the Gospels when Jesus is just beginning his public ministry and he's recruiting a, a team of people who are going to be his inner circle. And he selects Peter to be a part of that group. But when he recruits Peter, Peter's a fisherman. He lives on the northern end of the Sea of Galilee, and he's, he's made his living. He's established a business fishing. There's seven warm springs on the northern end. It's the best fishing in the lake, and that's where Peter has set up shop. And he meets Jesus one day, and Jesus says, follow me. And Peter really inexplicably does. And then the, the, the epistles at the end of the New Testament, first and second Peter, are written very near the end of his life. He's expecting his execution. So he kind of puts down his thoughts so I have this image in my mind of Peter when Jesus recruits him, most likely a teenager. He's grown up on the lake fishing. He's built a business fishing, so he's, his, his shoulders are thick with the muscle from pulling the nets out of the water. His forearms are braided with the muscle from that manual labor day after day. His hair is a little tousled, and his face is browned by the sun and the wind. And if you get close to him, he smells like somebody that works outdoors all the time. Peter's brash. 
Maybe he's brash because of his physical strength, but I really think he's brash because he's got a fire on the inside. He shoots his mouth off a lot of times before his brain quite catches on. But he's, got, he's a man of some real courage. He's a man that other men, other people will follow. When he's in the boat with his friends and Jesus comes walking across the lake, Peter says, everybody's terrified. I'm sure he was too. They've never seen that. They think it's a ghost. And he said, Lord, if that's really you, I want to walk. And he gets out of the boat. Dude. And he walks away. Now, I know he gets a little damp, but he walks away. And three years later, when Jesus is saying, you know, you're gonna, nobody's going to stand with me, Peter looks at him and said, Lord, you know, I don't know about the rest of these. I, I'm with you. I've questioned them. But I will never abandon you. And when they come for Jesus, Peter's the one that pulls a sword and separates some guy's ear from his head. And Jesus has to dial him back a little bit. So he didn't start out terrified. He started out willing to put himself on the line. But before the night was done, he's denied the Lord. And that's what we often remember most about Pete. They all abandoned Jesus. He wasn't the only one. He was just the one that called everybody else out before he did it. So Jesus personally reinstates Peter and says, Peter, you're going to have to feed my sheep. I'm not going to be here. You'll have to feed my sheep. And he did. The force of Peter's character, the scholars say, the secular scholars say, it was the force of Peter's character that was a stabilizing thing for the church in those early years. It's Peter that the Spirit of God sent to Caesarea when it was time for the non-Jewish world to get in on the Jesus story. But at the, when we read First and Second Peter, that's not the same Pete we're talking to. He's not a brash teenager trusting his physical strength. In fact, by the time we read First and Second Peter, I think his hair is streaked with a lot of gray. And you can see that he was one time a, a powerful physical person, but that strength has diminished. The fire hasn't diminished. You can see it if you look in his eyes. And now he's a man who spent his entire life with this Jesus story. And if you'll sit with you a minute, he'll tell you the stories. He'll tell you about that early morning when he was with the crew. And they were hiding because the, the sting of Jesus' crucifixion was still fresh and they were afraid. And the women showed up and said the tomb was empty. And Peter sprinted for the tomb. Stepped inside, it was empty. He'll tell you about that afternoon when Jesus stepped in the room. If you listen, he might tell you about the day of Pentecost and how afraid he was of public speaking. He might tell you about what it felt like when he walked through the streets of Jerusalem and when his shadow fell on people, they got well. Maybe he'd tell you about the trip he made to Caesarea and how anxious he was, how uncomfortable he was walking into a non-Jewish man's home and how shocked he was when the Holy Spirit fell. But before he steps out of time, he gave you and me some instructions. That's what's in First and Second Peter. And Peter writes with the simplicity you would expect from a fisherman. Paul's a scholar. And when you read Paul's writing, you think he is. Paul has some single sentences that are a page long. <laughs> Even Peter said, you know, Paul's hard to understand sometimes. <laughs> but Peter writes with the plain spoken speech you would expect him to. Now, I want you to listen with me to what he said. It's in your notes. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Hmm. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. He just gave you and me a, a treasure chest. 
of invitations and what it means to be a Christ follower. If we want to participate in the purposes of God, Peter just gave us a, a wealth from his life experience. He started recruited by the man himself. He said, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. Humble yourselves. It's the beginning point. It was the beginning point for Jesus. It said he had to humble himself and become obedient. And Peter is saying the same thing. Humble yourself. There is a God and it's not you. Humility doesn't say I have no value. That's not humility at all. Humility isn't saying I'm some weak worm of the dust and I'm insignificant. That's not it. God said you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He sent his son to rescue you. Humility is a, is a right understanding of who you are. The strengths which God has given you, the weaknesses which you have, the gifts you've been entrusted with, the gifts you don't have. The limits that come with your humanity and mine. The difference between ourselves and God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. We're a race of rebels. And the great temptation in our lives is pride. That I'm God. That I'll choose my path. That I'm the master of my faith. I'm the captain of my soul. See how far that ship sails. We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. You'll find lots of friendly people, engaging worship, and transformational encounters in exploring the Word of God together. There's something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 5 and 7 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. And then he gives us some specific instructions. Resist the enemy. Don't be passive with him. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith, he said. Don't you back up. Now, I believe Peter was not a good backer-upper. Bad grammar, but you get the idea. He said, you resist him. You stand firm. You're going to see him one day. You're going to see him one day. And I bet he's going to talk to you about it if you paid any attention. Stand firm in the faith, he said. And then he says something that's probably not as fun. He said, the grace, the God of grace who called you will, after you've suffered a little while. Peter said, we're going to suffer a little. You know, if it's my suffering, it's not little. In fact, I have come to understand something that the hardest part in this equation is the timing component. And the length for which you're asked to suffer is directly proportional to the degree that you're personally involved. If you're not the one that's waiting, it doesn't seem like a long wait. Think of it in terms of little people. If, if they want ice cream and you say, not until you eat your vegetables. I don't imagine that I just gave an edict that has years attached to it. But clearly from the emotions that are ex expressed in their response... They think the ice cream just got moved several years into the future. <laughs> and the barrier is broccoli and it's insurmountable. <laughs> if they were clever enough just to gobble the stuff down, they could have ice cream almost momentarily. But it requires quite an extended period of time of debate, of refusal to accept the terms of the negotiation. <laughs> then when they have to actually finally taste it, they're gonna do it in the smallest possible portions and chew it as slowly as humanly possible, right? And they're pretty confident. It was about three years ago they were promised ice cream. <laughs> and I remember when I was a child, I thought Christmas happened every decade. And now it happens every six weeks. <laughs> so when Peter said, you're going to suffer for a little while, it doesn't feel like a little while if I'm the, walking, the one that's walking through that shadowed valley. But he makes a promise. He tells us truthfully, candidly, you're going to suffer some. Not a popular message in contemporary American Christendom, but it's the truth of the word of God. After you've suffered a little while, God himself, Peter said, will restore you. I love this, that God is personally aware of what you're enduring. And when the season's over, he will personally restore you. He's not aloof, removed, disinterested, calloused. He will restore you.
and you'll be strong, firm, and steadfast. You'll be better than you were when the season began. What amazing advice from our friend. Now, the outcome of Jesus' obedience was he secured a very unique position. You know the verse. It says, God gave him a name that's above every name, the name of Jesus every knee would bow. God will respond to your willingness to follow him. Jesus understood himself to have a mission. He wasn't here arbitrarily, and neither should you and I be. In Luke 19, Jesus was in Jericho. He's had, he spent the afternoon in the home of the most wicked man in the city, the most notoriously wicked man in the city. Who do you imagine to be the most wicked person you know? I don't mean maybe personally know, but the most wicked person you're aware of. Well, that's who Jesus went to spend the afternoon with. And the more righteous folks are a little torqued. I suspect you and I would be. Well, I thought Jesus had more discernment than that. That person is wicked, immoral, ungodly. And at the end of the afternoon, Jesus makes a public announcement. He said, today salvation has come to this house. This man, too, is a son of Abraham. It's a rescue mission. Isn't that where we started? Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need the physician, but the sick. This man, too, Jesus said. And then he gives us his life mission. Jesus understood why he was here. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Jesus came to the earth. The whole Bethlehem initiative was a launch point to seek and to save those that were separate from the kingdom of God. And he had a plan for the perpetuation of his mission. Jesus was going back to heaven within 40 days of the resurrection. He was out of here. But he had a plan. In Matthew 16, he said, I will build my church. And hell itself won't stand against it. It's future tense. He didn't say, I have built my church. I have completed my church. I have established. I will build it. Jesus is still building his church in the earth. In Matthew 28, he gives us another component. It's post-resurrection. He appears to his closest friends. And he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now you go. That's not the way I would have written the narrative. Aren't you glad I wasn't in charge of the Jesus story? <laughs> See, I'd have kept him here for three or four more years. I'm thinking, dude, you could be really valuable on the banquet circuit. Think of the stories he could have told. We could have filled halls. Think of how much chicken he would have had to eat. I mean, he's got some stuff to imagine the look when he walked back into Pilate's office. You got the video cameras running. When he gets the centurion that nailed him to the cross and they have a little one-on-one -on -one conversation after that resurrection. Dude, get a little focused, don't you think? I'm thinking there were some useful things Jesus could have done, but that wasn't God's plan. Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Now you go, that's us. Jesus could have told his story, but Jesus had accomplished his. His reward was certain. God wants you and me to tell our story of how we have been set free so that we can lay up treasure in heaven. Well, what if everybody doesn't respond? Oh, you mean what if they hate you and say all sorts of evil against you? Jesus gave us some clues on that. He said, rejoice. He didn't just say talk to people that you think will applaud. It was his plan to perpetuate the story. God is still breaking forth into our world. The church, there's a lot of confusion around what that means. The church isn't about a building or a denomination. It's not an architectural style or a meeting time on a particular day of the week. Church is a word that describes the people who've chosen Jesus of Lord. There's three components. You believe Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God. Then there's a personal component. You accept him as Lord of your life. That's about priority. He gets first priority. And then there's an expression of that that you use your strength for. You serve him as king. To be a part of the church means you know Jesus of Nazareth as Christ, Messiah, Lord, and King. I don't really care where you sit on Sunday morning or what the label is on the building. If you don't know Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the, your Lord, and serve him as king, you're not part of the church. Amen. The good news is the church is comprised of people from every nation, race, language, and tribe. From every social economic background, at every IQ across the spectrum. It has to do with our relationship to a person, and his name is Jesus. 
Now, church is a universal, with a capital C, that's a universal label. Local congregations, there's a lot of diversity, and that's okay. We reflect culture, demographics, decisions about our specific congregations, what we choose to do. We're collecting toys these weeks. We're going to give those to the people who distribute them to the children around Middle Tennessee. Not every church has to do that. doesn't make us better or someone else diminished. They may serve in a different way. We have to have enough breadth of spirit to understand who the head of the church is. We may have different styles of worship or types of worship. Our podiums may be built out of different materials and the presenter may wear a different outfit. But if Jesus is the head of the church, we stand together. It's not about the label. It's not about being Methodist or Presbyterian, Episcopalian or interdenominational or Pentecostal. You can wear any one of those labels and not participate or any one of those labels and be a participant. The label is not the distinguishing characteristic. There are many expressions of obedience to Christ, and no single congregation is going to fully embrace them all. We've been a little arrogant, prideful, self-righteous, smug, and we've diminished our effectiveness because of it. There's a core of things about our faith that are non-negotiable. If they're not present, it isn't Christianity. Jesus is the Son of God. Uniquely so. He was born physically of a virgin. He grew to maturity. He was crucified on a Roman cross. He died bodily on that cross. He was buried. He was raised to life again. He ascended to heaven. He's coming back to the earth as a conquering king and the judge of the living and the dead. In the interim, he's established his church and given us an assignment. He sent his spirit into the world to provide for us direction. Now, if you don't believe those things, it isn't Christianity. Having said that, there's a whole host of things that are biblical and valuable on which we could disagree and we could both still go to heaven. If that's the case, I would suggest we extend a hand of fellowship. Well, we take communion with purple grape juice, and you take communion with red grape juice. Who's right? Yes. Well, you read this translation, and I read that translation. Or your music sounds like this and my music sounds like that. Or you believe the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation and I believe it's going to take place after the tribulation. Okay. We can still stand together. We have been a little confused. See, I think we're going to have to become more sophisticated consumers of the truth because one of the things Jesus told us is that between where we are And his return, I believe we're in that season that precedes the return of the Lord. And Jesus said to us that one of the things that will occur is an increasing expression of the false church. So you and I, we have to have the sophistication, the maturity to distinguish between the true and the false. And if your distinguisher is only focused on the label or the time of the week or the day in which it is, you are ripe to be deceived. You'll need to know the truth. That's why we encourage you to read your Bible, to be familiar with the truth. Because we can't complete our assignment if we are struggling with deception. Jesus is preparing his church. Our objective is simple. We're going to honor Jesus as the head of the church. That's what we want to do. We want to honor him, and we want to fulfill his plan. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. 
Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson. Alan Jackson.